Hello and welcome to our Structure Matters series, where we explore biophysical techniques for characterizing protein structure and how that information can be used. My name is Valerie Collins. I'm the Applications Manager at Redshift Bio, and today we'll be talking about X-ray crystallography and tertiary and quaternary protein structure. The first thing I want to address in this video is why we should care about protein structure characterization. I'm showing here the X-ray crystal structure of lysozyme, which is one of the most well-characterized proteins. I believe the number one reason for characterizing structure is to understand the function. All proteins perform a job, and how well they can accomplish that job is dictated by the structure. The next most important feature is that misfolded or aggregated protein can be immunogenic and disease causing. Monitoring protein aggregation can lead to discoveries in disease mechanisms or save patients against drug products that have gone bad. Preventing aggregation in the first place can be done through learning about protein stability and what buffering or formulation conditions that protein is happiest in. This will make for more shelf stable and manufacturable products. Lastly, we can use protein structure to maintain quality control and monitor batch to batch reproducibility. There are four different levels of protein structure. Primary structure is the string of amino acids that's called the polypeptide chain. This string of amino acids can fold into helical structures called alpha helices or sheet structures called beta sheets. This level of structure is called secondary structure. The 3D arrangement of alpha helices and beta sheets is called tertiary structure. And it's important to note that tertiary structure is made up of only one polypeptide chain. Quaternary structure is formed when multiple polypeptide chains come together to form the fully functional protein. Not every protein will have multiple polypeptide chains, so some proteins will be fully functional with just tertiary structure. X-ray crystallography will characterize tertiary and quaternary structure, which is what we'll be looking at today. X-ray crystallography offers the most in-depth information about protein structure at the atomic level and comprises most of the structures in Protein Data Bank, which as of today is about 170,000 structures out of almost 200,000 total. The process for preparing a sample for x-ray involves starting with a solubilized protein at a pretty high concentration to make it easier to crystallize. Crystals can then be formed a few different ways, but one of the most common is using vapor diffusion and the hanging drop method shown here. Most often this will be done with multiple different conditions to increase the chances of getting conditions that crystallize. Once you have crystals, you can then perform X-ray crystallography to produce a diffraction pattern. This diffraction pattern will be used to generate an electron density map, which will then be used to produce a 3D structure. However, this process is not a one and done method. The structure will then go through a refinement process where the generation of the electron density map is manually and automatically adjusted and optimized. And this can be repeated many times until the final model most optimally matches the diffraction pattern. While there are many pros to X-ray crystallography as we've discussed, there are a few downsides. First and foremost, you need a crystallizable protein and just the right conditions for that to be possible. Finding the right conditions can take time and effort, and it also means that proteins are analyzed in solid state and most often not in formulations or in vivo conditions. Additionally, the interpretation process can be painstaking and require an expert. Overall though, X-ray is capable of generating very high resolution structures for many different sized proteins. For a high-level overview of quaternary structure characterization techniques, I've highlighted some of the most important spe specifications for those techniques. For example, cryo-EM is gaining a lot of attention due to the ability to analyze samples in their native liquid conditions by flash freezing the samples. Thank you for watching this video. Again, I'm Valerie Collins, and if you want to learn more, check out our other videos and content.